We have to remember when, when the Gospels were written, these authors were not writing for us in our time. They were writing for an audience in their day. And people would know if the temple curtain tore. They would know if Jesus, if, if Herod, for example, Herod the Great, killed a lot of little baby boys around Bethlehem. So they knew that there were hundreds of witnesses Still. to almost everything That's right that they mentioned. Ladies and gentlemen, I am really excited. Uh, if you follow me on social media um, or, or you get my newsletter, which you really should, ericmetaxas.com, you know that I've been lately talking about a book called The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, The Amazing History and Sublime Mystery of the Passion. And suddenly here she is, yeah. Eugenia Constantino, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. In I studio. can't believe so you're in New York City, me and I'm, I'm I'm thrilled because I always it's always more fun to talk to people in so person. Good. You're a very humble woman, and you kind of act like, oh well, I just wrote this book. There is there is scholarship in this book that I think is going to really amaze some people. So first of all, welcome to the program, and congratulations on the book. Thank you, Eric, and thank you so much for supporting the book and and uh, promoting it. I really appreciate that a lot. Why don't you try, if you can, to help my audience understand, how is it that you came to write this book? Well, it's because I have I have read a lot. I've been speaking about this subject, the crucifixion of Christ, and also the trials of Christ for a very long time, for literally for decades. And um, I've read a lot about it, but I never found any book that combined a lot of these different elements of it. And that's what I really wanted to present because there are books by set lawyers about the trials of Christ, but they're not New Testament scholars. Or there are books by doctors about the crucifixion, but they're not biblical scholars or they're not Roman historians. Then I read a very nice book by a Roman historian and uh, I didn't agree with a lot of his conclusions because he's not a Bible scholar and doesn't really know, you know, first century Judaism. So because I have an expertise in all these areas, I felt like I was equipped to present the passion and crucifixion of Christ in a way that used the best scholarship and the best insights from all these disciplines because ordinary people would never stumble across the things that I have in the book. Part of the problem, I'm guessing, I'll just throw this at yes. you, is that that the, the Jewish tradition in many ways after Constantine in the fourth century, we kind of pulled away from the Jewish roots of, of the Christian faith. And so we, it, I feel like we just missed, we, we pulled away from a lot of important stuff. Maybe that's the first place to start. Well, we're not, we're not very connected to the Jewish roots of the faith. Um, I, I feel like I'm closer to that because as an Orthodox Christian, um, we're very connected to the early church. And I also think that this is one of my strengths when we're talking about anything having to do, with, do, to, to do with the early church. We're very connected to the early church. And a lot of things that we do in the church, in the Orthodox church, are very similar to what happens in Judaism, believe it or not. And as a Bible scholar, however, there were many things I did not know because we're not reading the Talmud and we're not reading the rabbinic commentaries. We're not aware of many of the things that were happening in first century Judaism. Many Jews today aren't because Judaism changed a lot from the first century when it was Second Temple Judaism until today when it's entirely rabbinic Judaism. So that's part of it, definitely. Okay, so there, there's a lot here, and this is what I find really just extraordinary, is that you've waded through these things. And, you know, to bring the perspective of what, what did Jews in the first century, not Jews who accepted Jesus, but what, what did the rest of the Jewish world think about who the Messiah might be, what right. some of the antecedents to the Messiah right. were to give right. us an idea of what to look for. The fact that much of that has been lost, literally until now that you put it in the book, I I almost don't know what to make of it because yes. you, you yes. can't think of anything more important. Yeah. And yet for 20 centuries, we've kind of missed right. it. How in the world, Yeah, you know, I wanna yes. ask God, why yeah. Why it's did you let us wait 20 <laughs> centuries before we made these connections? I, I don't, I think the early church knew the connections and they are present in very subtle ways in the Orthodox Christian church traditions. It's there, but then they, the Orthodox Christians today, don't know what it is because they have 
forgotten those Jewish roots. So it's there. And I didn't really find anything that wasn't known, but what has happened is many of these discoveries, as I said, are in one place. Either the Jews know them, so I read a lot of articles by Jewish scholars, or there are Bible scholars who know these things, or there are people who know medicine and there are doctors who've written on the crucifixion. So my point is that I'm not really finding anything brand new. It's just that no, none of those uh, details about the crucifixion of Christ were brought together in one place and made accessible to an ordinary person. Because even if you had a question like, why did the temple curtain tear, for example, this was something that I was always curious about. Where are you going to find the answer to that? You might read one book, it has one opinion, another book has another opinion, and then you don't really know where to go for uh, information. So, and then when you try to find out, it's sometimes over your head. Well, again, this is what is so fascinating. Anybody who has a modicum of understanding of what happened at the crucifixion theologically that Jesus makes the way into the Holy of Holies. We, we can understand the symbolism, but the, the gospels say the actual temple curtain in the temple was torn in two, which yes. sounds, I mean, it sounds, if it actually happened, which we think it did, this is called miraculous. Yes. This is a, an astonishing yes. miracle. Yes. But, but my question yeah. would be, do, would I have any extra biblical information that would say, oh yeah, something crazy happened? Uh, yeah. I wouldn't expect outside of the gospels to find any mention of this genuinely extraordinary experience. But you say that Josephus mentions it and you go into he, great detail. He doesn't mention the tearing of the curtain. What he talks about are the portents of the destruction of the temple. So the tearing of the curtain is not mentioned outside of the Gospels, but there it, there was also an earthquake that is mentioned outside the Gospels. And what is also mentioned outside of the Gospels is the breaking of a lintel, uh, the big lintel that, that you know the, that stone that goes across spans across the opening to the holy place, the holy of holies. Also, it's in one of the uh, non-canonical Christian writings. So there were other writings that were not did not get into the New Testament. Right. So some of these things are mentioned, but we have to remember something that's, is, I think, really important when we're dealing with history, because what happens is there's a tendency to insist that everything be documented, that we prove everything historically. But the problem is that most of the documents that existed, most of the books that existed in antiquity no longer exist today. So we have maybe only 10%, most uh, scholars think, of the books that actually existed in antiquity. So. We don't know what we have lost. Right. But to say that, well, there's no proof of that because it's not in some other, is there any corroboration? There is some corroboration that something happened. And of course, we have to remember something else. The gospels themselves are historical documents. They're not a fiction that was written by somebody to promote Jesus Christ. And that is a, a very common accusation that's being made. Part of the joy of reading this book is you walk us through a lot of what the Bible says, but you you really break it down and make it understandable. And it it deeply enriches our faith and our understanding yes. of the gospel. So so that's, I mean, if, if people buy the book and read it just for that, they're gonna be blessed. But you get into some of these details, like, look, even if you don't believe the curtain was torn or you're not sure, you talk about what we know about the curtain. Yes, what we know about and the curtain. It is so uh, yes. amazing that these Jewish writers, Josephus and yes. others, Do give us a picture it. of a, like, wow. Talk about yes. the curtain that, you know, I mean, talk about the temple a little bit, you know. I'd, I'd like to talk about that, but I also want to talk about, can I talk about why the Gospels should be taken seriously as yeah. historical sources? Yeah. Because I start the book with that. Why is it? So when people say, well, they just made it up, they just made it up to, prove that Jesus was God or something like this, like you mentioned, it is utterly idiotic. It's very lazy thinking. And while it might make sense to some people on some level, we have to remember when, when the gospels were written, these authors were not writing for us in our time. 
They were writing for an audience in their day, and people would know if the temple curtain tore. They would know if Jesus, if, if Herod, for example, Herod the Great, killed a lot of little baby boys around Bethlehem. So they knew that there were hundreds of witnesses Still. to almost everything That's right. that they mentioned. That's right. And, as, and Luke even mentions that at the beginning of his gospel. He checked everything out with the eyewitnesses. Even Luke testifies to this. So when when historians, ancient historians are looking at the gospels and using them and they do use them as historical documents. They evaluate them the way they evaluate any other historical document by the Romans or by ancient Greeks or anybody else. So they look at this and they try to determine whether or not this is credible and it's based on certain factors. And one of the factors is whether or not it can be corroborated by other sources, whether or not they're generally true. In other words, when we read the Gospels, we can we say that, do they meet the expectation of a historian that the person who's writing is reflecting what really happened in that time and place, okay? So for example, were there such things as Pharisees? Yes. Was there somebody named Pontius Pilate? Yes. And so, in other words, it's, it's genuine, it's true, because it suits the times. Does the author have uh, any kind of a motivation to lie? Well, all authors have some kind of motivation, but we're not talking about theological claims here. We're talking about historical claims. So there are many, there are many standards by which they evaluate the Gospels, and ancient historians generally accept the Gospels as good historical documents. And it's the Bible scholars that are trying to come up with some theories about why these things didn't happen. Well, I, again, there's, there's, this is such a rich book. There's so much in here, but, but you, you, you get into some specifics and you, you bring it to life. And you, when you do that, it's obvious that whoever wrote these things yes. couldn't have been making them up. And I, I mean, I write about that a little bit uh, in some of my books that it, it, only if you're not reading this can you make preposterous claims like that. Because once you dig into it, yes. anybody who understands anything yes. knows that, hey, this is not made up. There's so many details, just tremendous details. But Jeannie, we're we're out of time. I don't know how we can end. Maybe sing Tiper Majo or something like that. It's just so, uh, it's just such a joy uh, to see the work that you're doing. And I just want to say, I really do hope uh, that you continue writing along these lines because this is, this is really valuable stuff. Let me embarrass you by saying God is really using you. Thank you. Uh, thank and you. I got to tell you, uh, it I just makes me that. very doxaton kirion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And thank you so much for supporting the book. And I really appreciate that a lot.